Okay, hi everyone, welcome to lecture four. So in the previous lecture, we learned about uh, connected components in a graph. So as you guys can see here, this graph has uh, three connected components. Then uh, we explored the concept of um, graph fragmentation using uh, percolation thresholds. So uh, we uh, looked at how um, to evaluate the graph robustness and resilience to attacks uh, when um, computing the percolation threshold at which the, uh, the network will start fragmenting or the other way around, if it depends whether we're removing or adding edges. Um, so if we're, we're adding edges, the percolation threshold basically is um, denotes the stage or marks the stage at which the uh, largest com connected component emerges in the network as we're adding edges. Uh, by um, decreasing order of weights, okay? And otherwise, the, if we look at it or reason um, about it the other way around, then we think about uh, if we are removing edges from the graph, then this threshold basically will mark uh, the stage where the largest connected component will completely dissolve or disappear, okay? It will get fragmented into smaller connected components. So the, uh, the whole network or the whole graph doesn't hold uh, together anymore. Now, we also looked at a case study, which is a paper by Albert uh, and co-authors published in 2000. That was a nature paper. And we looked at how the exponential and scale-free graphs, they respond to uh, um, targeted attacks or random failures. And uh, this was actually an interesting case study of um, connected components and also uh, fragmentation, percolation thresholds, etc. So uh, feel free to read it again and like um, have a look at uh, the nice plots in the graph and understand the behavior uh, of these uh, graphs. So today uh, we will continue to explore along the same line. So if you guys remember, we started with centralities. Uh, how to quantify the importance of a node. Then we looked at, well, um, the connectedness of a graph through uh, investigating the connected components uh, in a graph. How can we find them? Uh, how can we break them down? And also, what is the largest connected component in a graph? And today we will look at a more specific, you know, like a, a more like an in-between um, concept. It's not like it's between centrality and connected components, which is the concept of a core of, an, uh, of a graph and periphery, uh, periphery organization. So we will look at K cores and S cores and uh, how we can possibly decompose a graph into different K cores. And at last, we will learn about the rich club coefficient. So uh, this is also another uh, metric that we can use to uh, quantify the importance of a node in a graph in a subgraph okay so let's start with the with the the first um, the first concept so the core and periphery organization in a graph as you guys have seen before so before we we learned about connected components so we know that these are fairly coarse uh, description they provide a fairly coarse description of a graph so we we can know like there are like you know four connected components or ten one of them is big, the others, the others are small. So it gives us, you know, a global overview of the network connectedness, okay? So it's a coarse overview, it's a global one, okay? Now, there is a problem with this because, well, in real world graphs, they, they do comprise a large connected component, which spans or includes, comprises majority of nodes, right? However, this does not allow us to identify subsets of graph elements or nodes that act as a critical backbone or information processing core. So you, you might have different connected components, but each connected component has a different property, right? So what we want to learn, we want to learn to analyze these different components um, and see which part of this component acts as, um, an, as, a, as a core is very important, okay? So we're going from a large scale to a slightly a small scale. We want to identify or discover the processing units, the cores, okay, of a graph, the most important uh, parts or subparts of a graph. 
So the other thing is like using connected components, we cannot detect densely connected and topologically central subgraphs, okay? So this is, you know, we can know that there is a connected component here, uh, three connected components, but this, as I said before, it does not tell us about the connectedness um, of that component. Is it densely connected? Are there any central subgraphs within this component that are very important, for example, okay? So here, this is what we will learn more today. So we're going from a, a global to like a more localized scale. And if you guys look at this, so which nodes do you think might be more interesting? So we have like, you know, two, three connected components. If we look at these three, so this is the largest connected component, okay? Now for the first one, these are equivalently important. They have like, uh, basically they're like, their degree is one. There is no difference in degree distribution or like, you know, in their character, uh, characteristic, topological uh, characteristics. But for this one, we can see that, well, this is maybe more central. So we can start to look at centralities and like explore that, well, this node is important. But if we look at this um, big component, what do we notice here? So we, if we look at the degree, just let's start with the degree, which is a simple metric, okay? We look at the degree of all these nodes. So these ones are like, have a degree of uh, one, okay? So these might not be very important, but if we look at these guys right here, this one, okay, and maybe this one, and this one, we would think that this part of the network, maybe, I'm just saying, okay, so we'll learn later on more how to do this, but this is maybe the core of the network. These are the most central nodes that are interconnected and they carry, process the most important information or flow of information in the network, okay? So let's look at the definition. Uh, what is, uh, how can we define a core periphery organization or identify a core periphery organization in a graph? So a graph G with a clear distinction between core and topologically peripheral nodes will show the following properties. So I'll give you a lot of examples, but let's look at those and understand. So first, the core nodes should occupy a topologically central position in the graph, okay? So these are the most important nodes. Core nodes should be highly interconnected, so this is very important. So the most important nodes in the graph, they should be highly interconnected, okay, with each other. Then, on the other hand, the peripheral nodes should be at least moderately connected to core nodes, so they should have some connections to the core most important nodes, okay, and sparsely interconnected with each other. Sparsely interconnected, which means those nodes that are at the periphery, they have no connections between them or very, very minimal number of connections between them, okay? Now, can you give an example of a real world graph with a core periphery organization? So I would like you guys, I'll give you a minute, uh, think of an example, everyone, okay? And define the node, define the edge, what the edge represents in your graph, what the node represents, and you have a core periphery organization, okay? You can write down on your um, sheets, so think about something. So I can give you a new definition in like in the final exam, right, uh, of a new concept that you haven't seen, and I ask you guys, please give me, give me an example, explain, like, Right, just reflect on that. Hmm. Okay, any ideas? Yes? Maybe work trade network for a specific Think about, let's say, bananas. Okay, trading, trading nets. Okay, world trading net and networks. Core uh, nodes will be uh, South American or that kind of countries. Okay, providers. Will be peripherals. 
which are not connected to each other but all connected to the uh, core ones and core ones also may be connected to each other to each other okay so this is a very good uh, example so basically you're saying maybe the best uh, 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 coffee br beans providers in the world they are like they they are, these are these the cores basically the most important notes they provide their goods to uh, different countries across the globe but they also might be these you know basically traders they might be interconnected so they might exchange goods between them so like the cores the core nodes are actually uh, connected or uh, uh, this is a, a very global scale so if you look within a local scale in country you might have uh, uh, different, uh, what, like, what do you call it? Like, let's say Costa, I like, like, like Costa coffees, for example, cafes. So these are like cores, they're providers, but they do exchange things. So they, so they have like a, an, a strong interconnectedness between them and they provide goods to customers. Okay. So a good example. Now, any other examples? Yes. Um, I'm not sure how they work, but uh, telecommunications stations in Communication station, yes. Uh, there are some sensor stations mm -hmm. uh, which are highly interconnected with each other, but uh, cell phones or like phones mm -hmm. are connected with them, but they are not connected directly to each other. Very good. So, like for example, in communication, you can have like different centers. Centers these are highly interconnected. They uh, they manage or they control the flow of information or communication flow and then uh, this goes outward goes out to the uh, users basically okay from these cen uh, centers okay good so I think we have good two examples so let's look at uh, other examples so here um, these so in another example these uh, can also appear in what we call when resources are scarce so when you have like also providers right like uh, they try to give uh, provide resources to um, you know like different uh, parties or users so uh, when you have scarcity of resources you have like a core that is like providing everything and like distributing you know all uh, the, the the resources across different nodes in the network okay or two different nodes in the network so there is some cost involved in forming connections between uh, nodes so you don't want to make all your nodes here okay highly connected because every connection you build here is going to cost you so you don't you want to avoid that so you centralize your 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 connections around a core and these cores actually they will be able to provide all info to um, all resources distribute them to uh peripheral nodes okay so that's this is like a a, a core periphery organization so a core is a cost effective solution for integrating and just um, for integration of distributed graph nodes in the periphery okay so it's good for integrating information so if you're thinking of any uh, of building a system that effectively integrates information it's good to have a core periphery uh, you know structure of your graph okay so this is for example uh, another example here so these are also good papers if you guys uh, would like to have a look at them to expand your knowledge in this field so these are amongst the first papers which uh, introduce the concept of core periphery organization in a graph and here you can see that these guys actually are the uh, like they belong to the core they are core nodes and the external ones they are peripheral peripheral nodes Okay, so it's quite easy to see. So this is a very simple example. Yes? Um, how is this different from the scale-free graphs? Oh, the scale-free graphs. Okay, so this is a very good example. So the scale-free graphs, you might have, like, just to, I will explain, uh, maybe I can have, this is a good example, but I can add another uh, page here. So how is this different from the scale-free graph? So what is the, the, the characteristic of a scale-free graph? You have like different hub nodes, right? So the hub nodes, uh, if we look at the previous, um, at the lecture where we looked at centrality measures hub, hub nodes, you might have uh, like different connections uh, between these central nodes, they're connecting. Okay, so you might have something like, uh, let's say, something like this so 
let's draw this example. So this is a central node. You guys can see it's highly connected to the peripheral nodes, okay? But here you can see that you might not have like all nodes do not come at the periphery. So um, you can have a central node in a graph, okay? But you might not have like uh, the interconnectedness between central nodes. So the thing is to have a core periphery, you need to have all core nodes highly interconnected between them in a core. So you will understand this when we define the k-core. So for example, uh, if I remove, um, so this is, these are, if I remove this part, it will be easy. You can see that this is just simply a central node and it actually it acts as, you can see the core is just the center. It's a very simple model. And the other nodes are the peripheral nodes. But if we have more nodes in a graph, then you can have other central nodes, but these might not be very highly connected. So these might be um, um, kind of isolated. So there is only one bridge between them. So you can have different distributions, but you might not have, you know, the cores highly connected between them, like something like that. They're like very connected. Um, and then something like this, okay? So here, these are the peripheral nodes, right? But this is the core, so it's, it's different, okay? It's, diff it's, like, it's, it's a generalization of centrality, you can think about it, okay? So right now, let's look back at this example. So hypercores, this is like, we can generalize this to hypergraphs, but for here, like remember when we talk about hypergraphs, it's a, like this is another, it's a more complex um, uh, generalization of graphs because you can have like hyper edges overlapping. So your core, like you can have overlap between hyper edges. But yeah, this is, I would say at this stage, let's think about just cores and graphs, like simplify it. But then we can think about how to generalize the concept of a core and define it in a hypergraph, okay? So here, let's look at these two examples. Um, so for the first one, the right one, we can see that we have what we call an idealized core, oops, idealized core periphery um, structure, which means that you might you have different nodes, like these are the cores, they are like highly interconnected. It's like they're fully interconnected here, okay? But then you have a set of nodes and these are the zero blocks with very few ties with other nodes. So these nodes actually, you can see that node 5 have very few ties with the core nodes. So this is, you know, if you see, if you organize or you, you create an adjacency matrix, uh, what we call a blocked adjacency matrix with a block structure, base structure, to emphasize the core periphery pattern, you can just by flipping your nodes around, right, you can make this pattern emerge and see that your, your, your graph actually has a, um, a peripheral nodes and a set of core nodes that are highly interconnected. So these are interconnected, you can see from here. Uh, these are, between them, they are like highly interconnected, these cores. And the other ones, the ones at the periphery, so if you guys take time to draw this, even create a small example, you will see this, uh, it will just uh, come, come across very, Clearly, you can see that these guys right here, they are uh, they are not connected between them. So they're sparsely connected, not even sparsely. They're disconnected, okay? Uh, and then they, they are connected to the core nodes. These are, you know, like um, the core nodes right here, okay? So they're connected to the core nodes. And this is the, the, the definition of a peripheral node. A peripheral node, uh, peripheral nodes are weakly connected between themselves, but they are connected, they should be connected to the to the, uh, the core nodes, okay? So now the other one is, um, we see here, it's also a, um, this graph, this adjacency graph uh, matrix displays a core periphery pattern, but what we know this is not idealized, which means the core nodes, right? They have, they are highly connected, but they're not like, uh, like extremely, they don't fulfill the highest, the maximal capacity of connectedness, okay? So this is another way of spotting or directly uh, finding core periphery organization using adjacency matrices. So 
Core nodes, they are adjacent to the other core nodes. So you can see it here. They're adjacent to the other core nodes. And core nodes are adjacent to some peripheral nodes. So uh, these are the peripheral nodes. And you can see that for the peripheral nodes, we can see there are like some adjacency right there. And the peripheral nodes do not connect to other peripheral nodes. So this is what is clear right here in this uh, yellow block. Okay. Now, this is another example. So you can see, uh, you know, here we have multiple cores or processing units reaching out to different peripheral nodes. And you guys can see this branching out phenomenon. It's very, uh, it's, it comes across clearly when we have core uh, periphery organization. Now, one good thing about a strong core periphery organization is that it helps optimize robustness to random node failures. And you guys can have a look at this paper. Uh, so uh, here in the paper, they, they, they basically explore this aspect. So what happens if I have a core periphery organization of my graph, uh, how robust it is to random uh, failures, okay? So this is another type. So we looked at scale-free exponential, but this paper explores a different type of organization. And uh, you can have a look at this. So we're not gonna study this paper today, but it's something to look at, okay? So also they call it like the central backbone. So it's very important there. Here's the thing. So in graph theory, the, the names, they change. Uh, sometimes you might read textbooks, they call them cores. Others, they might call them central backbones or central, you know, like uh, backbone subgraphs. So there are different names, but at the end, it's like they convey the same concept, which means, you know, central nodes, highly interconnected, connected to peripheral nodes which are sparsely or limitedly connected, okay? So far we have explored three topological scales to examine graph structure. So what are they? So if you guys remember first lecture, I say like second, third, and this lecture. So what are those three scales? Okay, so we looked at centrality. What else? So centrality, it tells us, um, so we have different definitions for centrality, but this allows us to look at different nodes, right? Independently, but also, you know, it depends on the, on the, if we're looking at a degree, it's local. If we're looking, if you're using the shortest path length, length it's global, right? So we looked at the concept of centrality. What else? What is the scale if you explore this? So we have, for example, something like that. So this is a small scale, right? And then we looked at the global scale, which is the uh, spotting the connected components, right? So that's, you know, looking at the global scale in a graph. And now what we're looking is that within a connected component, we might have other things, right? So we might have important central nodes. So now we're looking at something in between which we call the mesoscale. So here, basically, the node centrality measures, they are, they reflect the microscale topology of a graph. Then we have the components or the connected components, they reflect the macroscale topology of a graph. And in between, we have what we call the core and periphery, which is basically allows us to explore the mesoscale of a graph, okay? 